Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. We are gonna be starting in just another minute or two, but while we're waiting, if you would like to introduce yourself in the chat box, say your name, and let us know if you've ever been to Angel Island or Ellis Island, or perhaps even both islands, or if you've never had a chance to visit either island, we'd love to, to hear who's seen what. And we'll be starting in about another minute. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. My name is Ed Tephorn, and I'm the executive director at the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation. I am so excited to have all of you joining us today, and I am so excited to be joined by our moderator and our expert panelists for tonight's session. Before we begin, I just want to give a little bit of an introduction to the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation. We are the primary nonprofit partner working with Angel Island State Park to help preserve the buildings, as well as the histories and stories related to the former U.S. Immigration Station at Angel Island. And I am thrilled to have an opportunity to quickly introduce Casey Dexter Lee from Angel Island State Park, who will share a little bit more about the state park. Hi Ed, thanks. Angel Island State Park is a California state park. We're one of 280 parks in California in the state park system. And we are in the middle of San Francisco Bay and state parks has a variety of uh, natural and cultural resources as well as recreational resources that are protected for all Californians. Thanks so much, Casey. And for all of you who are watching today, we definitely have a very informative and exciting panel for you. Hopefully you've got a lot of questions for us. And so if you do, please feel free to use the question and answer box to type in your questions. We'll be responding to some of those live. We'll also be trying to respond to them, some of them via chat. So as those questions come up, feel free to, to use that Q&A function to, to ask your questions. And if any of you are having any problems with the webinar, please feel free to send me a message via chat and I'll try to help you figure it out. And with that, I'm going to introduce and turn it over to John McInnes from Save Ellis Island Foundation. Uh, good evening slash afternoon to everyone. My name is John McInnes. I'm the Vice President of Project Management Planning for Save Ellis Island. We're a nonprofit partner the National Park Service. We're tasked raising the funds to restore 29 um, um, unrestored buildings, on the, mostly on the south side of Ellis Island. Uh, which make up uh, a hospital complex for immigrants, uh, 750 bed hospital complex that was uh, in 1954 and is now considered surplus government property. It's our uh, hard hat tours that we conduct through the buildings, which is an uh, experience to see buildings, which are almost like a fly in amber. Uh, it allows you to see buildings, the construction in germ theory from the turn of the century and also to hear the stories of the men and women who work there and the immigrants who convalesce there. And so I hope you to join our mission. You can certainly follow us at uh, saveellisisland.org. Uh, tonight, we're going to be meeting two panelists uh, from uh, Angel Island and um, from Ellis Island. Uh, Casey Dexter-Lee is, uh, is a state park interpreter for the Cal State Parks. Jim Peskin is a senior mentor educator with Ellis Island, and they're going to be making a presentation to talk about the similarities and the differences between the islands and the missions that both um, um, Angel Island Foundation and Ellis Island Foundation do to preserve the, not only historic buildings, but also the his, historic story that remained within the, in the, in the, the buildings. Uh, but first, I'd like to introduce Jim Peskin. Uh, Jim Peskin is uh, our senior educator. He's also our unofficial historian with Save Ellis Island. 
he has done a great uh, job of finding uh, new experiences and new stories to share with guests on our Hardhead tour. And if you're in New York City next week, he is doing the 1230 tour uh, at Friday. It's uh, the restart of our tour experiences. So I'd like to welcome uh, Jim Peskin and his presentation. Um, hi, everybody. I'm going to uh, share my screen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be working with all of you in California at the other, at the opposite end of the continent. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of Ellis Island, of, of how, you know, what it is and how it works. And um, I brought some photos along. Ellis Island is a pretty photogenic place. Um, and I'll kind of let them uh, kind of show you. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the senior educator thing uh, is actually a big, uh, it's a very lovely title, but I'm basically, uh, basically a tour guide. And this is the, this is what I show people. Um, the first slide here is Ellis Island as it looked at the peak of immigration, which was around 1907, 1910. And the one thing you should know is that when people say Ellis Island, that's not correct. There are actually three islands in the complex. Um, the immigration building's on one island, the general hospital is on a second island, and the third island is where the location of the contagious disease hospital. And that's actually where we give the hard hat tours, which I will be and looks looking so forward to getting started again. Um, to tell the, the story of Ellis Island, you really have to start on the other side of the ocean. And that's where we're gonna go here. This is a picture of the Red Star shipping line, uh, which is located in Antwerp, Belgium. Um, and this is where many voyages to the United States started. This is where virtually all of my family came from. They took trains from the far reaches of Belarus across you know, all of Eastern Europe and they arrived in Antwerp. And this was where they were ready to get on a boat to come to a new life in America. Well, before they got on the boat, they had to deal with these guys. Um, and these are a bunch of the medical technicians um, because you, before you got on a boat in Antwerp to come to the United States, you had to go through a very careful uh, medical screening. Now, the question is, why was this? The, well, the reason is that American immigration law prohibited anyone from entering the United States who was either ill or who was something called likely to become a public charge, which means unable to work. And uh, there, if someone arrived with, in either one of those situations in New York's at Ellis Island, um, they would promptly be deported. Um, and the uh, reason that the steamship companies had such extensive screening in Europe was that the steamship company would have to pay the fare of the person deport, being deported, and the steamship companies were fined $100 every time they made a mistake. So it really cost the steamship a lot of money if they messed up. Hence, there was very, very careful scrutiny before anybody got on any boat to come to the United States. Um, this is a ship arriving in New York Harbor. Uh, you can see Ellis Island in the upper uh, left-hand corner here. Uh, and when they arrived in the harbor, they had to stop immediately. And they were boarded by somebody from one of these, a, a physician from one of these uh, vessels here. This is the quarantine uh, the bureau from uh, the Port of New York. And they stopped every single vessel that arrived in New York City. And it was not allowed to proceed into the harbor until it had been examined for what the officials they are called the plague. The things that they were concerned about mostly were things like cholera and typhus. So if anyone on the boat had that, uh, they would be taken off the boat and they would be uh, taken, uh, I'll show you in a second where they go. And sometimes it was, it was, if there was an outbreak, it could be a few people and sometimes it was an entire boat. Um, no one arrived in New York unless they were scrutinized by the New York City's Harbor Patrol. This is where they went. Uh, the, this is one of three places. The bottom picture is Hoffman Island, and this is where immigrants who might have had active cases of cholera or typhus, they were taken there, and they were, you know, treated, and if they survived, they ultimately uh, were able to enter New York City. Um, the second uh, part of this triptych is Swinburne Island, where people who were, um, who were exposed to one of these serious illnesses who they wanted to observe, and they were kept there for a quarantine period of time until they thought it was safe for them to travel. The objective of everyone was to get to the top, and that's Ellis Island. Um, the uh, quarantines in, at Swinburne and Hoffman Island were fairly infrequent, but when it happened, it was affected a large number of people. Um, so let's get back to Ellis Island. Well, once the boats cleared the uh, quarantine uh, and the quarantine officers, they would, uh, the boats would travel up the harbor 
but they would not stop at Ellis Island. All of the boats would first go to the piers in either New York City or in uh, Jersey City uh, or in Hoboken. And all of the first and second class passengers would get off the boats there. And all of the uh, third class and steerage passengers would then board on what they called barges. And then they would be taken to Ellis Island for another, yet another medical inspection. So this is a group of immigrants who are getting off of their barge, or it's, it's really a ferry, um, and they were proceeding to uh, go through immigration processing at Ellis Island. This is uh, the immigrants. They're going up to the second floor. Most of the, most of the processing at Ellis Island happened on the second floor. That's where the Great Hall is. And if you ever visit it, it's an extraordinary uh, room. They would go up the stairs, and this is what they would encounter at the top of the stairs, or actually as they, they went up the stairs and along. They would be stopped and they would be examined by one of these guys in a military suit, but that's actually a surgeon who worked for the US Public Health Service, and they were in charge of inspecting every single immigrant who arrived at Ellis every single day. Now, this was a huge job because Ellis Island could admit like three or 4,000 people in one day. And in order not to backlog ships into the harbor, they had to figure out a very efficient way of examining people because there were only somewhere between six and 10 doctors who were stationed at Ellis Island. So what they developed is something called the line inspection, which really amounted to a visual inspection. As people walked by the doctors, the doctors were trained to look at the immigrants and see any, for any deformity, you know, color of their eyes, Eyes, their gait, anything like that. And if they spotted something, they would pull out a piece of chalk and they would put one of these markings. They would, in mark and chalk, one of the symbols that you see here. And these represented all of the conditions that were not allowed into the United States. So if someone was marked with this, they would be pulled out of line and they would be taken to a secondary examination room where another doctor would actually take a look at them. Most people, again, 80% of the people in mo on most days got through here. And this is a group of people who passed the medical inspection are just waiting for their interviews with the immigration officials and they would ultimately go along their way. The average wait time at Ellis Island was about four or five hours. It wasn't dissimilar to you know, San Francisco airport. Um, this is a group of men who have been detained because they have some skin problem that is not admissible and they're being examined by, a, you see a doctor here. Um, this is another examination that would have, was have going on. The law said that if people were mentally ill or did not have sufficient intelligence to work, uh, or they were likely to become a public charge. So they had a very elaborate form of testing where they evaluated people to see whether they had, had any mental illnesses or if they simply did not have the intelligence to be self-sufficient. And all of the people in there have an X and that's what the symbol for that was. Um, let me, this is not only, let me give you a little bit of an idea of what these, uh, of what Ellis Island is. This is a map of the, of, the, uh, of the complex. This is the immigration building here, which is all the pictures you've seen up until now are of this building. This building was built on an actual island that a Mr. Ellis really did own, and it dates back to geological times. That's, and it's got a name, it's called Island One. If you look in the center of the map, you'll see another island. This is, a, this is an artificial island that was built exclusively for the purpose of putting a hospital on it. And on this, on island two is a general hospital. Um, there's our, our surgical rooms in here. There is a, uh, there's a psychopathic ward for people who are mentally ill. There was a uh, delivery rooms uh, because babies were born here. Um, but the main thing is this did not treat people who had diseases. But the reason this was built on an island was because when Ellis Island was working, there were no drugs or any really any any way of really treating infectious diseases. And the way they protected the people in the main immigration building from anyone who was ill on island number two was they put the island number two across about 100 yards away and put a very large body of water between the two for the protection. Now, you'll see that there is a third island in the complex and it is officially named Island 3 and that's where John works and that's where I work. This is where we give our tours. Island 3 is the contagious hospital and this is where people were taken who, who had con infectious diseases and this was set another 100 yards away from the other island specifically to, care, to make sure that none of the germs went from one island to the other. So these are all these were all, we are very familiar now with the terms of social uh, isolation. That is the main strategy that they had about protecting from people from disease. Um, the 
the Contagious Disease Hospital was built according to something called the Pavilion Plan, which was promoted by the very famous nurse Florence Nightingale. And at the end of the 19th century, this was the most modern and up-to-date and effective hospital to treat contagious diseases. And Ellis Island had really one of the state-of-the-art hospital, contagious disease hospitals um, in, in, the country, well, in the public health service system. Um, you'll notice there's a long, long hallway, and you'll see that there's a whole bunch of buildings on either side of the hallway. That is the principle of a pavilion hospital system. Each ward is actually a separate self-contained unit. It has a kitchen, it has uh, nurses' quarters, it has observation rooms, bathrooms, all of those things, and it is entirely discreet from any other uh, ward. And the reason for that was mostly because, again, there were no, uh, there were no drugs to treat illnesses, and the things that people had here were very contagious. What they knew at that time was that if someone had one infectious disease, they had a pretty good chance of curing them. Uh, through, and they had, I'll show you how they actually did that. But if that person picked up a second illness, that really was potentially lethal. So the idea was that each of these pavilions was designed to treat one disease at a time. And at Ellis Island, uh, all of the contagious disease wards were actually called measles wards because measles were the most was the most common infection that uh, that had that was you know that immigrants actually had. Uh, let me show you a measles ward, and there are 16 of these at Ellis Island, and they all look exactly the same. And when I first started to give tours, I had to really look twice to make sure I was going down the right hallway and into the right one. But this is a typical pavilion hospital room. And the principle was the way they got people better was the only tools they had were fresh air and sunlight. Therefore, this room has huge windows that let in fresh air and sunlight. There's a really elaborate, there's a ventilation system in here. Um, they didn't put too many patients in there so that the germs would be uh, diffuse. You'll also notice that the ceiling is shiny. You can see up here, they thought that germs could cling to, uh, to uh, bumpy surfaces. So they painted them with enamel paint. The corners are all rounded. So none of those little germs could hide in the corners. Now, this all sounds a little bit of like mumbo jumbo, but the fact is, this was incredibly successful. The mortality rate of this hospital was less than 2%. And if you look at hospitals today, that's as good as any modern hospital today. And they did this without the use of any kind of drugs. Um, so it was uh, an extremely successful uh, 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 hospital strategy. Um, this is what the hospital looks like today, and this is the central corridor, and the name of it is uh, it's called the spine. And all of those measles wards that you saw, that I showed you, are all aligned you know, on either sides of this hallway as you walk down the hallway. There's one really interesting feature that some people see and some people don't, is that the, um, the wards are arranged, they are offset by 25 or 30 yards which is a very inefficient way of building. But the reason it was done was that they knew that if you open the door of one ward, and if there was another one opposite it, when you open the door, the germs can go out in the hallway and then get into the ward opposite it. So what they did was they staggered the openings of the doors because they didn't figure that germs could, you know, go out the door, make a sharp left turn, and then make a right turn and get into the other ward. The consequences of cross-contamination were genuinely lethal, and that was one of the strategies that they used to, uh, to get people better and to not be exposed to second illnesses. Um, this is another image of what the hospital looks like today. This is one of the stops on our tour. Um, this is called the morgue, and I think you can see there's uh, places where bodies were kept here. But also, strangely, this is a light that you would find in an operating room. So there's an operating room in this morgue. Um, and that's because this was also a place where they did autopsies. And also, it's a little hard to see here from this picture, but this was set up like an amphitheater, which means that they did public autopsies. Now, this was not for the general public. This was done as an educational thing for uh, training other doctors. The public health service was very careful about, uh, about training its future doctors. This is one of our most famous and important pieces of machinery, and uh, this is called an autoclave. And the reason this was here was that they, the big danger in a hospital at that time, and even today, is cross-contamination. You know, people getting germs, you know, from other people's, uh, you know, 
well, now with COVID, it's with their breath, but sometimes you know they get stuck in the sheets and stuff like that. So every this is this is a huge machine, and it's the, built to the scale because its job was to sterilize four mattresses at a time. They would put four mattresses in there, close the doors, and they would pump in the high pressure steam, which would heat it and kill most of the germs. They also passed every bit of immigrants' clothing in there, all the bed sheets, all the nurses' uh, gowns. Everything went into here so that no patient was ever exposed to anybody else germs. So this is a vital part of the hygienic strategy of the hospital. This is really what the hospital looks like today that when we give our tours, this is what things look like. Um, this is actually one of the most interesting features of our tour. Um, this is a, a part of an, an installation put up by a French graffiti artist uh, by the name of JR in 2014, which is actually this, at the same time that we started our tours. What he proposed to the Park Service and to Save Ellis Island was he wanted to take images from the, uh, El the uh, Ellis Island photographic archive, blow them up on large photographic paper and paste them up all over the facilities. Well, we thought this was a fantastic idea because when you go through the hospital, there is nothing in these rooms and we have to kind of explain with words. But when you put the faces of people who we know were at Ellis Island up in these large pictures, it is such a wonderful device to tell stories and for people simply to understand the presence of real people in there. You, I'll, let me just show you in, for a second. This is the original picture. This is a, a group of children who had a fungal infection of the scalp, which was really one of the biggest problems that they had. Uh, and these kids were actually in the contagious hospital because this is highly contagious. And so this is what it looks like when it's actually put up on the, uh, uh, and this uh, window, uh, there's nothing in scale here, but this window is about 10 feet by 10 feet. This is big. Um, the last picture I wanna show you is actually kind of something that really defines the culture of Ellis Island. This is President Teddy Roosevelt arriving at Ellis Island in 1903. And the reason he came to Ellis Island was because Ellis Island had gotten very bad press. There was uh, all kinds of corruption with the officials there. People could bribe their way in. Uh, immigrants, they felt some were being abused. It really was not a very pretty picture. But Teddy Roosevelt understood that the people coming into Ellis Island were people who were absolutely essential to the American economy because we were growing, we needed farmers, we needed workers, we needed, you know, we needed people to serve things. And, um, he said that if we are going to bring these people to our country, they need to be treated with compassion and respect. And Teddy Roosevelt came himself to Ellis Island to deliver this message to the staff. Uh, so that since Roosevelt was there, the culture of Ellis Island has been to treat immigrants with compassion and respect. The hospital itself is perhaps the largest demonstration of culture and respect because that hospital was not really built for American citizens. It was built for immigrants coming to our country who were in need of medical attention. And the medical uh, attention they got was absolutely first rate. That hospital was as good as any private or public hospital anywhere in uh, the United States. Um, so if you wanna see Ellis Island, um, we, uh, because of the pandemic, we, uh, uh, we are currently offering a virtual tours if you go to our website. And as John mentioned, if you want, if you're in New York, which you could be, or if you want to come to New York, uh, we will be resuming tours, uh, next week. And you're going to, I will be there, uh, doing the tours. Um, these are just some figures about Ellis Island. I'm not sure we're going to do that. Um, so are there any, uh, John, were there any questions that people had? Uh, no, no, no one has uh, submitted a question, but certainly and you're free to do so. Uh, we'll have plenty of time to get back to uh, questions. I have one question, Jim, and that is, you know, when we talk about how the mortality rate was so low at Ellis Island compared to, you know, why do you think it was so dramatically low when compared to city hospitals in New Jersey and New York? The, the, uh, you broke up a little bit, but, um, uh, but uh, you wonder why the mortality rate was so low? Or the, I, I didn't, I, I didn't hear your question. City hospitals in New York. Um, um, why is it that, that Ellis Island, the hospital was so successful treating patients and had such well, a- Well, there were several reasons. When, uh, okay, there were several reasons. One is you saw that there were, I just showed you that there were two medical, there were two medical, th there were three medical screenings before anybody got to Ellis Island. So the people who came there were generally ill, or were generally ill. 
uh, were not ill, and they, there was real sanctions for to make sure that people didn't arrive there. Um, secondly, most of the people making this voyage tended to be younger, and they were people coming to the United States to make a living. So there was a fairly healthy section of the population that was making that was making this very arduous journey. And then the hospitals themselves, the doctors and the nurses were absolutely at the time the uh, we we had a presentation from some nurses the other night and they said that the public health service physicians who worked here were some of the best clinicians and diagnosticians in the united states and the other thing that puts this hospital apart from everything else is that the nurses who worked at ellis island all had to be come from professional nurses training schools. You only found nurses of that caliber, either at the most expensive private hospitals or in the people hired privately. So the quality of the nursing care, the quality of the doctors who were there, all of those combined. And the other main thing was that people were screened before they came. So they were not dealing with people who, had, who were predisposed to be ill. Um, someone would like to know, uh, for those who are unfortunately died, did they get buried on the island or were they sent back home to cremate? Oh, there were, uh, well, both things have happened. As a rule, no one, there's no dirt on Ellis Island, so being buried there is, is not a possibility. Um, if, they're, if they had no family, they would be taken to the Potter's Field of New York, which is a place called, um, uh, ah, the name's out of my head, but there's an island in New York which is still being used today that actually is where uh, people who don't have families are, are buried. Um, hard Island. A hard Island, sorry. Um, but if someone died there, the family would come and claim the remains and they would arrange for burial. So there were, the Ellis Island had connections with, with uh, mortuaries and funeral homes all over New York City. Uh, the Public Health Service had its own burial ground on Staten Island. And we even have one story of a young Australian uh, uh, sailor whose family requested that his body be sent home to Australia. So he was sent back to Australia and he was buried there, so. We have a question about was the, was the hospital state run public health agency or US immigration? Ellis Island, the key factor, the thing about Ellis Island and Angel Island is that these were federal facilities. Ellis Island was built because the US government took over immigration from the states. And so everything about Ellis Island was entirely federally run. When the US government took it over, it designated the United States Public Health Service as the, the uh, program that was going to administer and take care of all of the medicine there. And the Public Health Service is a national program and it's still in existence today. And they wear the, the same, they wear uniforms just like these guys did is here. So there's a real continuity of medical care, but these were all absolutely federal programs. All right, well, thanks, Jim. Uh, everyone will have a chance to ask questions of Jim later. It's at the end of our program, but uh, now I want to turn it over to Casey Dexter Lee. Uh, Casey is a California State Parks interpreter. Um, she works uh, on Angel Island his, for 20 years, I found out, over 20 years. You're, you're a very youthful looking person for working at a place for 20 years. Um, she works to preserve the historic buildings and the historic stories of our main women. So, Casey, welcome back. All right, thank you so much. So I'm actually in our hospital building on Angel Island, and I wanna show you some photographs to kind of orient you because most people have heard of Ellis Island, but that is not necessarily always the case with Angel Island. So we usually have to start a little further back um, to just get folks uh, knowing where we are and what this place was. So let me load up these photos for you and we'll start showing those off. So uh, our first image here is gonna be of the San Francisco Bay area. Angel Island is in the middle of uh, the bay. We're about three miles north of San Francisco and about one mile north of the Tiburon Peninsula in Marin County. And uh, Angel Island is the largest island in San Francisco Bay. Uh, our neighbor is Alcatraz, uh, just to the south of us, which is a little more well known to the public. And we actually have two separate facilities here on Angel Island. Um, as Jim was saying, the Ellis Island was an immigration station that built on hospital facilities. We were a large island that had an existing quarantine station and added an immigration station. The rest of the island uh, during the operation of the immigration station was the US Army. So there were a variety of different federal agencies operating here at the same time. 
Now the quarantine station was located in Hospital Cove, today called Ayala Cove. And this is actually where uh, ferries land to bring visitors to the park today. But the ship in the center of the um, photo is the USS Omaha. And its job was actually not to transport anyone, but the steam engines were used to decontaminate ships that were brought here to Angel Island. And there were um, up to 50 to 60 buildings at this site at the peak of the quarantine station. So it operated between the 1890s and into the 1940s. And you can see those fine uniforms that uh, Jim was talking about. We uh, see some inspectors here. They're on their launch, the Argonaut. Uh, part of the quarantine station's job was to go out to ships that were arriving. And then once those ships were brought here to Angel Island, if they had disease aboard, the crew here on the island would go aboard and decontaminate those ships. So down at the very bottom of this photo, you can see all these men standing with their gas masks. There's some small cages that actually have white mice in them. And they use them like canaries in a coal mine to go back aboard the ship after uh, it was treated. And one of the reasons they needed this is because one of the um, treatments was cyanide gas. And if that had not dissipated, it could be fatal to workers here. I mean, there were some deaths uh, amongst workers during this cleaning process of the ships. And this is our version of the autoclave. These are disinfecting tubes. And this also is for um, not people. <laughs> so all of the luggage, clothing, anything that um, might need to be decontaminated are put into these long tubes. They were about 60 feet long and six feet in diameter. Uh, people who were quarantined here might not have immigration um, status questions. They might just be people traveling to San Francisco that had illness aboard. And some of their oral histories uh, talk about getting all their possessions back, but not everything was the same color as when they turned it in as far as clothing. So some of those processes could be pretty harsh. So this is um, one of the, the launches that would come up to those ships. Ships from the uh, Custom Service, Immigration Service, and Quarantine Service would all go out and meet incoming ships uh, coming into San Francisco Bay. They would go aboard and start looking at who needed to come here. If they had immigration issues, they would be sent to the immigration station, and we have a hospital facility here for immigrants with medical needs. So in the bottom center of the photo is the administration building, and that's where folks were, segregation, uh, were segregated. Racial segregation was part of the standard operation here on Angel Island. They segregated people into three categories, Asian, European, and Chinese. Now, Chinese immigrants were separated from other Asians because of the Chinese exclusion laws that were in effect at the time. And Chinese immigrants uh, had a different set of rules and requirements to be allowed to come in. Most Chinese people were not allowed to immigrate. So everyone here was trying to be an exception to that rule in one of the exempt classes. Uh, medical exam was pretty standard for everyone. The exams here, um, oh, excuse me, this is the administration building. So this is what it looks like when you arrive. And the hospital uh, would have uh, segregation as well. And they did not have an isolation facility here. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little more as it led to some unhealthy conditions in the building. And this is a layout of what the building looks like. This is up here on the second floor where I'm standing today. And it's that same kind of pavilion style. It has a central hallway with wards that branch off of that um, with uh, doors that don't align. So in an attempt to um, prevent illness from going from place to place. But this building also had a, a wall that was built between the side where Asian immigrants stayed and where European immigrants stayed, uh, Asian and Chinese. And so that was because they wanted the building to basically be effectively two buildings. There were a lot of um, stereotypes, misconceptions, assumptions about people coming from Asia and their level of illness and contagiousness. And so there was this uh, effort to separate white immigrants from Asian immigrants. Uh, so this is the first floor. They had a small dining facility. There were larger dining facilities for um, folks not staying in the hospital and a few attendance quarters. But there were a lot of complaints from the staff about 
the inefficiencies. There was no isolation ward. One of the wards where people stayed had no bathroom. There um, weren't a, a sufficient attendance quarters for the staff that might have to work here overnight taking care of people. And this is uh, what the hospital looked like just a few years ago, about 10 years ago. And we have gone through a, a major rehabilitation of this building. And that is where I stand today. You can see a little in the background. It's looking up, it's looking up, it's looking a little better. Um, and then this last image is just one of the poems that is carved into the barracks building in the detention barracks, another building uh, on this site where people were uh, held if they were healthy. Now the writing on the walls is really what saved this place. Uh, all of the buildings on Angel Island almost overnight um, their fate was changed when State Parks was, I'll say, encouraged by the public to save these buildings um, and save this history. The people who really made this happen were the community. And people um, started coming here kind of on informal field trips with one of the first rangers that really um, got curious about the writing in the building and started talking to people about it, Alexander Weiss. And he started talking to folks at San Francisco State they started bringing out some of their students from um, particularly from their Asian studies departments. And so when they got home from their field trips, they would talk to their parents and say, I went to this place, Angel Island, it's amazing. And for some of them, that was the first time they learned that their parents had been here on Angel Island. Uh, it was a part of their story that they didn't want to talk about. Some people came under false pretenses and were worried about repercussions or deportation. Um, others just have a, a negative memory of being here. And the medical exams are one of those first bad memories that people would have. So I wanna take you a little bit through our space here because we have uh, converted the hospital building into the Angel Island Immigration Museum. And this space um, has three main exhibits at this point. We still have a few exhibits to create in the future, but we have um, our under this microscope museum or excuse me, exhibit. And that is gonna be telling the historic and some contemporary stories of medical gatekeeping. Uh, the decisions of what diseases are chosen to be deportable diseases and how that affects the people that are coming through. We also um, are able to show folks, oh, let me stop sharing that so you can see these screens a little better. Um, the, the immigration inspection process. Uh, the medical exams, are looking for all kinds of illnesses. Now, um, Jim mentioned that the average stay on Ellis Island was a few hours. Angel Island, the stay is a few days. Um, and if you were Chinese, the average stay is three, three and a half weeks. So much longer stays. Um, and even for Chinese immigrants, um, three weeks isn't a typical experience. Most folks were either here two or three days uh, very similar to Japanese or European immigrants, or three, three and a half months. And sometimes that would be because of medical issues, and sometimes it's because of the entry hearing process. So um, we have some interactive uh, moments here in the museum. So I want everyone to sit at home. You've been sitting for a while. I want you to flex your muscles. All right, if you feel like you have big, strong muscles, that might actually help you emigrate. Um, here on Angel Island, they're looking for reasons that people might become a public charge, might not be able to work, um, make a living. So underneath, you'll find this story here asking you, are you strong or weak? And this is the story um, of the Lopez family. So basically the father of this family from Mexico was described as scrawny and weak and the immigration officials thought he would not be able to provide for his family. He had uh, three children and a pregnant wife when he arrived here on Eagle Island, and they left Eagle Island with five children because the twins were born while they were here um, detained at the hospital. Uh, let's take a peek over here, and you can see some of those medical exams in progress. Excuse me. So um, folks here generally had to uh, disrobe either partially or totally, depending on 
um, what illnesses or diseases they are looking for. Um, there also were um, questions about the age, particularly of Chinese immigrants, um, because the immigration officials didn't believe the information that they were giving, they would do age exams to bear, ask, the immigration service would ask the doctors here to do age exams to try and verify the age of the immigrants. Now, these could be quite invasive, right? They're looking for key factors of puber puberty, um, teeth eruption, all kinds of things that um, would, would leave a, a pretty poor impression on you if you had just arrived in this country. Now, this hospital, as, as Jim was saying, is pretty state-of-the-art, right? This is, they've got microscopes, right? They, this is the cutting edge of medical technology of the time. So they're um, examining um, stool samples, blood samples, looking for parasitic infections. And I actually have a poem here that is about the... Uh, medical exam. So this one says, uh, I cannot bear to describe the harsh treatment by the doctors. Being stabbed for blood samples and examined for hookworms was even more pitiful. After taking the medicine, I also drink liquid, like a dumb person eating the huang lan. You have to forgive my Cantonese pronunciation, but that is a, a bitter herb. So basically someone that can't complain and um, is frustrated by this experience. And the liquid they're referring to is the treatment for hookworm, uh, a parasitic infection that uh, small intestinal worms are found in your body and the, the liquid helps loosen those from your intestinal walls and send them uh, out of your body. Now, um, the, the treatment of folks here could be controversial. Uh, there were doctors here that performed uh, experimentation and uh, did not have the consent of the patients that were here on the island. We um, see that in the example of uh, Dr. Glover. Now, Dr. Glover is a very complicated person because he, at the same time as doing these experiments, he is also um, advocating for more sensible enforcement of immigration law. So something like hookworm, he said, should not be a class A uh, disease, not something that automatically gets you deported. It should be class B, which it will get you deported if it affects your ability to earn a living. So downgrading that a little bit. Um, this is another doctor, Dr. Chotter, who took the opposing position that that disease should be, oh, excuse me, this is trachoma, that trachoma should be a class A disease because it is uh, easily spread. Uh, so they were debating the merits of the medical issues. But here on Angel Island, these doctors had sometimes um, conflicting jobs. Their job as doctors is to help people get better. But this is an immigration facility. So the job here at Angel Island's immigration facility was to keep people out. Now, it is sometimes nicknamed the Ellis Island of the West. <coughs> Excuse me. But the people who worked here called this facility the guardian of the Western Gate. Their job was to keep people out. So the immigration officials would look to the doctors and say, this is a group of people we are trying to exclude. What is an illness common amongst the, uh, this region that we can put onto the list as a deportable disease so that we can deport people for medical reasons without having to go further into the process of deportation and finding other reasons to deport people. So it's a, a, a complicated story here on Angel Island because it wasn't as straightforward as just making people better. Um, one of those incidents I talked about where um, that lack of isolation work was a problem was the case of uh, Mr. Stevens. He came um, for treatment of a parasitic infection and was put into a ward that had previously uh, held a patient that had meningitis. Meningitis is highly contagious. Uh, the immigration, or excuse me, the uh, hospital workers disinfected the room. Uh, they did what they thought best to clean the room. But unfortunately, they didn't do it well enough. And Stevens and two others that were put into that room later all caught sp spinal meningitis. Um, Mr. Stevens ultimately died from this illness. And uh, we actually have in our exhibit some of the letters, the memos going back and forth 
describing um, contacting the family and letting them know what happened to their uh, loved one. And I'm in the surgery room now. We don't have a lot of information of the types of surgeries that took place here, uh, but the for real serious stuff, we know that patients were sent back to San Francisco. Um, and there was cooperation between the immigration hospital and the quarantine station because they were both run by the public health service. <coughs> I wanted to show one other feature. I don't know if it'll show up on the camera well, but one other thing they did to try and prevent uh, the spread of illness here was actually how the ceiling and the walls meet. They're actually curves there. I don't know if you can see that curved, but the idea being that germs would get caught in those corners. If it was a square corner, they thought the germs would get caught in there and would uh, not be able to dissipate and move on so it could be cleaned. All right, so I want to turn things, oh, I guess I uh, want to mention coming to Angel Island right now. Uh, it's extremely challenging. <laughs> uh, we hope to have ferry service starting up uh, again in March. Normal, uh, under normal conditions, there's uh, ferry service year round. There's two um, directions you can come from, San Francisco or Tiburon. And in the meantime, we have some virtual exhibits to help uh, people connect with the history here, particularly for this new uh, exhibit space, AIM, Angel Island Immigration Museum. There's a virtual exhibit with on our partners page, Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation. And Ed will put that link up in the chat for you so you can check it out. Uh, so that's uh, kind of our, our soft opening. The exhibits were just installed in November, so we haven't had a chance to open this space to the public yet. But as that happens, we'll definitely put the word out and invite you to come visit in person. The park itself is open, so there is hiking and biking um, and access to the exterior of these sites. So if you do want to come to the park, it is possible. But uh, our buildings are not quite open yet. All right, I'll turn things back over to the Q&A. Casey, I have a question for you. Jim mentioned that we really only have one medical record that survived on Ellis Island. What happened to the medical records on Angel Island? We, yeah, we haven't had a lot of luck in finding medical records here as well. We did have a fire in the administration building. Um, so if your medical records were tied with your immigration file, it might have been lost there. We do find information in some of those medic, uh, immigration files, and most of the immigration files can be found for this facility in the National Archives located in San Bruno. So it's San Francisco's National Archives, but it's actually uh, just south of us in San, San Bruno. And some of those records have been digitized, but not all. So it's, uh, it's moving towards digi uh, being available digitally. Uh, there are oral histories that help us well, as well, and the poems um, in the, the barracks. All the poems are written in Chinese, so it's just the Chinese experience that we're seeing with those. Uh, so we, we, you know, get it to all these little bits from all over to try and put these together. Now I'm going to invite Jim Peskin to rejoin the conversation, but I want to give you the first question, and that is you, these these hospitals. Jim can answer the same question. These hospitals closed in the middle of the 20th century. Why are they important today? There was no famous doctor, no famous nurse, no famous patient, no famous treatment. Why are they so important? So I would say that places like this are important because we are still grappling with these issues of public health and public health as it's tied to immigration. We've seen that in the last year, deciding when people will be allowed to come in and when they will not. Um, but even uh, as late as 2010, we have uh, an exhibit that talks about the HIV ban. So folks that had tested positive for HIV or AIDS were banned from immigrating or even traveling to the United States for a period of time. And so these are issues that are still coming up today, and we definitely want to spur conversation about those contemporary issues through the historic lens, but also through not so historic stories like uh, what's going on today. So we have a, our exhibits were just finishing being designed uh, just as COVID-19 started coming into the United States. 
So we have just a beginning of the start of the story of COVID-19 here as well. Uh, so we're, we're trying to keep those conversations going and talk about what's going on now too. Jim? Well, the, the, um, the medical things that happened at Ellis Island, it's the largest public health service project ever that's ever been done. And the lessons learned from operating a health system at that scale, I think is an important part of American history because we've been able to do that. And one of the reasons that I am so committed to working at El in the hospitals at Ellis Island is that the hospitals, as I mentioned before, the purpose of them was to treat immigrants when they came who were in distress. And the fact that our country mobilized the resources to have this compassionate care 100 years ago or 100, 120 or 130 years ago. And over the last few years, we aren't doing this anymore. This is an example of what, what we can do and what our moral responsibility is as a country. So, I mean, when I give my tour, I have a very strong feeling to share that we have tremendous capability um, and we need to use it. And I need to remind people every day of the power of what, you know, what we can do. So, I mean, it's a, it's a really important story. And there, as we open up every little kind of leaf, you know, like if we look under the leaves at Ellis Island, there's always a new story. Uh, I, I'm looking at some other things. And what I'm finding is that Ellis Island was actually instrumental in the foundation of the, um, the National Institute of Mental Health because for about 20 years it was a, it, it treated neuropsychiatric patients and those doctors went on to be the people who are instrumental in identifying mental health as a national issue. And I've just started to look at that. So every time you open a corner or door at Ellis Island, there is some absolutely critical thing to the history of medicine, to the history of immigration. It really deals with both of those, so. Yeah, for, for, people, for visitors of both sides, what is the most powerful, Message get from visiting these sites. Okay, we, we had trouble hearing that, John. You broke up a little bit. When, for people who visit these sites, what is the most powerful experience they come away with from, from being in the buildings? And seeing Casey, you want to hear the stories? Sure. Um, at our site, I think it's a lot of. Um, light bulbs going off and not necessarily knowing the story here, not necessarily um, knowing about the institutionalized racism and how people were treated so differently based on where they were from and what they looked like. And um, because we do have this resource in the poetry that was left behind, we have uh, over 100 poems in the detention barracks that were carved into the wooded walls by detainees we get an opportunity to listen to the people who are actually here. You know, often when we tell, tell historic stories, we, um, we really only have those um, documents that are left behind and, and things to reconstruct. But here we have a first person experience that is written in an, an art form. So it's beyond facts, right? It really goes deep into the feelings of people as they were experiencing this. And so I think there, there's those layers of um, emotion that come up with realizing uh, the people here didn't, a lot of them did not have a good immigration experience and uh, were not, you know, looking at Angel Island as this beautiful place with a lovely view, but looking at it as a prison and a barrier to their ability to come into the United States. Uh, and for some of our visitors, they are descendants, people whose families came through this site. And for them, it's a, another level of emotional journey to connect with the place that their, their parent or their grandparent came through. And, um, you know, I've seen a lot of tears here uh, at this site as people kind of come to understand what their family member or what someone who maybe didn't look like them experienced when they were here on Angel Island. At Ellis Island, the, the thing that really kind of blows people away is the is how modern and successful the hospitals were. 
they have this idea of 19th century medicine as you know being really primitive and it was not what they didn't have were pharmaceuticals they had everything else and even today you know the the flu pandemic you know the the 1918 flu pandemic hit the united states 100 years ago while Ellis island was open and the same strategies that were used then are being used today uh which is you know we, we get we talk about that a little bit um we so it's the it's how it's how modern and how advanced and the sophistication of the medicine that was practiced at Ellis Island, which is so different from Angel Island. I mean, there there was you know racism and uh, there was um, uh, you know all kinds of really unpleasant things that happened you know in the latter half of Ellis of Ellis Island's um, existence. But we when we after because the immigration declined, you know, stopped pretty virtually in 1924. But before that, um, it really, the, the people are so moved by the humane treatment and the care and the quality of the medicine. We get a lot of cheers too, because we have, I mean, Ellis Island has an impact, which is kind of extraordinary. I mean, something like what, 40% of the American population went through, El you know, is descended from someone who went through Ellis Island. So there's almost half of the people that we see are descended from people who came through there. And so they are relating to their personal experiences, you know, and then we get people, I, uh, someone that I knew, he came over as, you know, after World War II as a child, and he got sick and stayed at Ellis Island for a few days while he got better from the mumps. And so there are still people living today who actually were in those hospitals and actually were treated by that. So you get, I mean, Ellis Island has such, such a broad scope you know, um, and then people are surprised at the, at the, well, oh, it's repeating, okay. Jimmy, you had a question. Someone wanted to know, uh, were there a lot of Chinese immigrants going through Ellis Island and were they discriminatory treatment um, administered? There were them? very, very few. If you look at the, uh, if you look, if you look at the ship's manifests, there were maybe a few hundred a year that came through Ellis Island. And um, I, I don't know if there were enough of them there for them to be discriminated against. You know, we, mm -hmm. it wasn't in, in California. It's a, it's a whole different situation. Um, there's plenty of discrimination against, you know, Irish, you know, Jews, uh, you know, people from Eastern Europe. Um, but um, there were just almost no Asians there at all of any kind. They just, they just didn't come. The only Asian, there were a few, you know, Chinese immigrants who came through there. And when Ellis Island uh, closed to immigration, uh, there were, um, there were uh, Asian sailors uh, because the public health service was examining merchant sailors who came to New York. And there were hundreds of thousands of those, many of whom were Filipino and Chinese. And they were actually, they were treated in the hospital. But they weren't, from what we can tell, they were not segregated uh, because there, there weren't enough to, they, they, there wasn't enough of them to, uh, uh, to do that. Uh, this is the last question for both of you. You both touched on it, but again, can you t tell everyone how you can see these hosp your hospitals either in person or virtually? Casey, go ahead. Uh, so for Angel Island, uh, the only way to visit in person is by uh, catching a ferry from San Francisco or Tiburon. The um, buildings aren't open yet, so hold on a moment until we get those things back uh, open for you. Uh, but if you want to visit the site itself, you can do that now. The um, virtual exhibits are the, definitely the best way to uh, visit the, immig the Immigration Station Hospital or AIM, Angel Island Immigration Museum, and that's at AIISF.org, our partner's uh, website. There's a Immigrant Voices as well as AIM exhibit on there that can give you insight into the experience here on Angel Island. We do uh, distance learning as well. All of our programs are sold out through mid-June um, and sold out, they're free, <laughs> um, but they're booked. And uh, so we are, we're not able to take additional groups uh, until after mid-June, basically when the school year ends. And that's through uh, the California State Parks program called PORTS, P-O-R-T-S. And there are programs throughout California at many of our state parks on a diversity of topics um, from nature to history. And uh, so that's a, a way you can 
sign up to do either an in-person, or not in-person, but an on-demand program, so with your group, live with a presenter, or we do occasionally do uh, home learning programs, which are live broadcasts that anyone can connect to. Uh, it's not interactive, but you can have kind of a experience of seeing us tell the stories of Angel Island. Um, okay, how to get to, how to see uh, Ellis Island. Well, the Immigration Museum and the Statue of Liberty are both open and there's ferry service from New York. Uh, there is usually ferry service from New Jersey, but they had a little catastrophe with the dock, so they're gonna have to fix that. Um, the, to see the hospitals at Ellis Island, you have to come to Ellis Island. And starting next week, um, you will be able to uh, get a tour of, you know, we, me and several of the other uh, mentors are going to be giving uh, live tours starting next week. In the meantime, or if you're in California or anywhere else in the country, um, there are several live, there are several virtual tours on the website. Um, there's also pictures on the website. Um, and so if you go to saveellisisland.org, all of those things are available uh, there. Um, is there anything else I'm missing, John? Nope, I just want to thank you and Casey. Oh, come and see us. We're there. I'm going to be working. Please, thank you. 1230 <laughs> Friday. I want to thank Casey and Jim for sharing their passion and sharing their stories with us, with all our guests. I want to now turn it back to Ed to close us out. You're muted, Ed. Thank you. Thanks, Casey. Just wanted to say thank you to everyone for tuning in today and to thank John for doing an amazing job moderating the panel. And thank you, Casey and Jim, for sharing your expertise and passion for these two amazing historic sites. I'm so excited that the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation has had an amazing partnership with California State Parks for the past four decades and very excited that we are continuing to build our, our partnerships with Save Ellis Island Foundation and other institutions at the Statue of Liberty and, and Ellis Island. And my hope is that in the future we'll be able to continue to bring additional programs to all of you that really help to continue to compare and contrast these very important histories at both islands. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us this afternoon and this evening for those of you on the East Coast. Please check out our websites uh, for either the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation, for Angel Island State Park, or for Save Ellis Island Foundation if you were intrigued by today's presentation and want to learn more information. But until then, have a great evening, have a great afternoon, and please stay healthy and safe. <laughs>